Hello everyone, my name is David Bernstein and I am the co-director along with Dr. Rosalyn Bertram of the uh, Child and Family Evidence-Based Practice Consortium. And um, we are delighted to have all of you join us today for our second webinar in the Janus webinar series for MSW faculty. Um, the title of our webinar is, our webinar series is uh, Integrating Evidence-Based Practice in MSW Curricula. And uh, we are pleased today to have with us, in addition to Dr. Rosalind Bertram, Dr. Suzanne Kearns from the University of Washington, Dr. Patricia Cole from Washington University in St. Louis, Dr. Elizabeth Canada from the Wheeler Clinic in Connecticut, and Dr. Dana Marlowe from Fordham University. I wanted to just take a moment and um, uh, just quickly mention that the consortium began in 2004 and has been a wonderful networking opportunity for a number of us who we're looking at how to implement on a larger scale evidence-based programs and felt that we were in the wilderness doing that until we were able to uh, connect with one another very spontaneously and from there we've grown. I want to encourage you to look at our website, um, the um, Child and Family EBP Consortium website so that we can um, so that we can, can really add you to our list, have you engage in blogs, and see the many activities that we are engaged in, and certainly want to welcome you to become part of our network. I uh, also would like to mention that this is being recorded. We'll be po the recording will be posted on our website. And um, with that, uh, I think we will just proceed into the body of the webinar. I wanted to mention that um, we are encouraging people, as a few of you are already, to, um, it, to utilize the chat function on the Adobe platform. We will be uh, looking at, we will be tracking those and we plan to weave all of this discussion into a, a question and answer uh, session that we, we will be responding to later on. So um, please add all questions as well as comments uh, into the chat function, the chat box to the right of your screen. The, um, the Council on Social Work Education, as probably everyone knows who's attending this webinar, is uh, recognizes that teaching social work students how to access, analyze, interpret, and appropriately employ evidence is critical to effective social work practice. Uh, I presented in the class here at the DU School of Social Work yesterday, and that was, um, a, 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 a was clear that the students who are about to graduate, although having had limited exposure, um, still um, have not had a great deal uh, in looking at uh, preparing for um, the discussion of evidence-based practice and implementation science uh, as they are about to go right into the field. Uh, the EPOS competencies um, include one that is related to practice-based evidence and knowing what's out there and evidence-based practice, uh, but I think uh, that the, um, the um, political issues involved that surround evidence-based practice and really continue to be so prominent in our profession um, really are reflected in the diversity and really the scarcity that we know is, is the case in MSW programs with regard to both EBP practice as well as um, implementation science. So even though competencies do relate to evidence-based research, what does this provide meaningful, uh, does this really provide meaningful guidance? 
Um, and that's when we get into, and this slide really details nicely the debate in social work that I was um, just referring to. There are questions regarding the definition of evidence-based practice. As we all know, evidence-based practice has become a new mantra and also is uh, the gateway to funding. And as such, um, people's approach to it has really diluted uh, some of the more orthodox notions of evidence-based practice. There's been some real concern about client diversity as well as client choice and the application of evidence-based practice models to particular populations and a concern that there's a constraint on what, um, on what people can actually um, get if there is too much attention to evidence-based practice. There's a lot of support for eclectic practice and that um, per, per, particularly because it really allows for practitioner creativity and a real concern that any defined evidence-based practice model will really inhibit people from being as creative as their, um, as, as their education should have them be. Um, and then there are also major implementation issues. Again, um, there's not enough attention paid to the burgeoning science of program implementation. And that also creates concerns about how do you get something that really is evidence-based into the real world without really fracturing it in such a way that you will not get the results that EVPs have shown in, in other forms, in other uh, clinical practice. Um, the ability of MSW faculty and programs to teach EVPs, we know from the studies that we've done already, um, have to do directly with faculty knowledge, with the faculty governance structure, which so, which can constrain uh, all kinds of reforms within uh, the social work curriculum, uh, depending on the orientation of particular faculty, since that's the gateway to what is offered in the schools. Uh, field practicum site limitations, uh, some of which come from the program developers really also uh, constrain the level of knowledge that is integrated into practice sites pertaining to evidence-based practice models. And also there, there is so much required curriculum that it really does constrain the flexibility with which programs can um, actually uh, improve the content for both evidence-based practice as well as implementation science. And so with that, what I'd like to do is turn this over to Rosalind Bertram from the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Social Work. Uh, Rosalind has been really the prime mover uh, um, of the consortium in many ways, and certainly with regard to this whole, um, to this whole area of uh, passion that many of us have to impact curriculum in the MSW programs throughout North America. So Rosalind, I hand this off to you. Thanks, David, and I'll just hold it for a little bit and do a quick handoff. Just to refer some of you who may not have been part of webinar one, we actually went into uh, some of the findings from the study that you see on the current slide uh, in webinar one that speak directly to those major themes in social work in terms of evidence-based practice in MSW curricula. Um, that's uh, webinar is available for your review on our website. Um, just want to highlight once again what we're trying to do with this Janus webinar series. We're really trying to create a bridge between developing evidence-based practice uh, in the real world uh, social work settings uh, simultaneous with um, developing uh, evidence-based practice and implementation science and frameworks within curricula, MSW curricula. And the goal of this series is to develop a network of faculty who share an interest, uh, who are willing to share their struggles and their successes in trying to make that bridge happen. Um, 
we think that there are research and publishing opportunities. In fact, as we put together this webinar, we actually think that there's an article simply in comparing and contrasting the four universities um, that are presenting how they've approached creating this bridge. Um, so we want this to be an active webinar series, not passively uh, hearing what others are doing, but actually becoming part of uh, an effort to create change in MSW curricula. Um, and I think with that, to save time, I'm going to hand it off to one of our, our uh, university presenters, uh, Trish Cole from the George Warren Brown School of Social Work, um, who's going to present how they've approached this very thoroughly, as a matter of fact, uh, at Washington University in St. Louis. Trish? Okay, I'm, I'm here. Let me, um, here we go. So welcome this afternoon, and I'm going to talk about our, our model, which we have created an acronym for the five-step process. We call it the FLARE model, um, and it is guided by well-respected leaders in social work as well as adapted from um, evidence-based medita um, medicine. And I'll talk a little bit about the adaptation in, in a little bit. Um, our model is based on the idea that evidence-based practitioners must integrate the best available research evidence with their professional expertise, their client, their client's values, as well as the social context in making both practice and policy decisions, and, and that it is ultimately about maximizing the likelihood that, that clients will both receive and benefit from the most effective interventions, um, programs, and, and policies. The, um, so FLARE stands for formulate an empirically answerable question, locate the best available evidence, assess the best available evidence, integrate the best available evidence with professional judgment, persons involved, as well as social context, and then review and, um, the process and, and outcomes. So how we teach this, it's actually integrated in, into our curriculum and, and recognizing that advanced standing students don't take most foundation course or many of the foundation courses, we actually have a required three credit hour course around our evidence-based practice model that advanced standing students all have to take. Non-advanced standing students get this get the information integrated across their, their foundation courses. And um, to Joanne's point, I think one of, one of the key pieces for us, most of our students, some, but most of our students aren't here to become researchers, but we do want them to leave as, as consumers of research. They need to understand how to critically assess it and how to use that to inform their, their practice. And, and that's really how um, our, our curriculum is, is shaped and, and focused on. So in the research methods course, they, um, that covers the types of empirically answerable questions out there, background questions, effectiveness questions. Um, we cover how, how do you ask strong questions. So what are the components of, of strong answerable questions? And, and then how do you locate the best available evidence? What's the, what's the types of evidence? Um, that are out there from systematic reviews, RCTs, to stakeholder perspectives. So the, the whole, the whole um, perspective they, or, or um, uh, I'm drawing a blank on the word, across the, the whole, um, never mind, you get it, the multiple layers of evidence. Um, anyway, as well as then how, how to assess the evidence, how, how do you evaluate it, and, and then how do you review the process as well as, as the outcomes. And then this, this evaluation component is, is of course, re reinforced in, in the evaluation course that all students are, are required to take in, in their concentration year. Then in practice, our Practice One course, the um, Foundations for Social Work Practice with Individuals, Families, and Groups, these skills are, are reinforced and students are, are required to do an assignment based on a, a simulated client in which they then look at the um, unique circumstances of that client. They create either a background or an effectiveness 
question and and then have to develop an annotated bibliography um, and and go through the process of, of, of the worksheets around doing a, a lit search and, and then answering that, that question. In, in practice two, which they take in their second semester, it, we really structure that as a capstone course that builds on everything that they've learned in their first, first semester. And, and students are actually then partnered with community agencies to do a group project in which they apply they, they apply the FLARE model in which they are, um, they basically conduct a needs assessment, interview, talk to key stakeholders, allow the, the question to emerge from the stakeholders, and, and then go through the process of using um, evidence-based, um, using the evidence and um, as well as the local and client context. So part of the needs assessment is really understanding the community, understanding the organization, and understanding the client served. And then they actually have to go back at the, at the end of that semester. We bring all of our, um, all of the organizations that are part of the group process back. We have a, um, and, and they, students are required to present and, and present what they, what they have, have in fact um, found. In addition, they are also required in, their, in the foundation year in their integrated seminar um, to do an individual evidence-based practice assignment that is, is done in conjunction with their, with their foundation practicum. And this assignment is really the first opportunity for, for students to apply that, that model individually, outside of the classroom, in a real world setting where real challenges and, and sometimes barriers exist. The other real benefit that, that we see is it also exposes our field instructors to our evidence-based practice um, model and, and the process. And, and we believe that, that field instructors as well as, as their colleagues within the agency are, are shifting in their understanding of the process as well as understanding the usefulness that it has to their, their agency um, as they go through the process of applying the process to, to a question specific within that agency. And, um, okay, let's move to the next one. So then, then we have, I, I just want to come back to um, the, the evidence-based medicine model. And, and so where our slight modification comes in is the evidence-based model uses um, the same top two circles, but client factors is, is used as a, single cir um, as a single circle in the evidence-based um, medicine model. And we believe that circle four, that, that fourth circle around social context was really necessary in order to in in order to preserve our focus on on the social environment. The other piece that that is 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 really important is this visual makes it look like each circle gets. 25% um, of the attention when, when making practice decisions, but we absolutely know that that's not true. Uh, circles expand or contract with each given circumstance and in each client's um, situation. So sometimes we have a lot of evidence, and so, so that evidence is, is larger. Sometimes we have very little evidence to guide us, and, and then that circle is smaller, and we rely on circles, particularly judgment and experience, to make decisions that are in our client's best interest. And, and so that's, that's why that step four in our model, that integration of um, best available evidence with professional judgment, the persons involved in, in social context is, is really seen as, as critical in our, our model because it depends on the setting in which they're working. In a, in a hospital setting, a social worker, they're, they're, they're may be, they may be good at using best available evidence and actually in some cases through medical trials creating um, evidence, but we know that Many social workers are, are in settings that that level of evidence is, is, not, is not at that level. So it's the social worker's role then to translate that evidence, what is available, into something that makes sense to clients and their families. And, and we believe 
that this process actually helps social workers um, to, to do that. Okay, so we also differentiate sort of the evidence-based process model, which can be used with both practice and policy, and I, we do use this with policy questions as well. I think sometimes that policy piece gets lost but it's really important that we're also using evidence to inform policy as, as well as practice. So we, so we do highlight that. But we differentiate then sort of, I talk about it sort of as we have the process and the noun, so the verb and the noun, and in that process is what I just talked about. But certainly there are also empirically supported treatments or in, empirically supported interventions. Um, in, in, in empirically supported practices, you see lots of different acronyms to, um, to differentiate, but this is about what treatment do I use. So, so that question, um, sort of that evidence-based practice or evidence empirically supported treatment question is really only about answering what treatment is best for a client for client X who has X problem. And, and so we do spend a lot of time differentiating that. And I also want to say, so we, the process is integrated across our curriculum, but in their concentration year, we do have the opportunity for, for students to take, I believe it's seven different empirically supported treatments that they can be trained in both as three credit hour courses at the end, and then which are 45 contact hours. And we also have some, for instance, motivational interviewing, um, cognitive processing therapy that are one credit hour skills lab. So we have, we have both. And, and I, believe, I, I believe, though it, though it is, um, there are many challenges, particularly around the process, um, I, I believe balancing both the process and, and the treatments in, in terms of evidence-based practice is, is important, and I, I love that we're able to, um, to do that. I, I, um, some, of the, some of the seven, so we have motivational interviewing, we have trauma-focused um, trauma cognitive behavioral treatment, motivational, I said motivational, cognitive processing therapy, applied behavioral therapy, um, DBT, there's two more, and I'm drawing a blank on those. I, I apologize for that. And, and now I'm going to, I want to go ahead and, and turn it over to Sue. Great. Thank you. And actually, Trish, before we transition totally, there are a couple of questions in the chat box. I was wondering um, if you wanted to address uh, both the one from Roslyn that was wondering if there's a BSW program feeding into your program, and from Joanne asking about exposure to implementation science. Okay, fantastic. And and um, I was having a hard time reading the question, so I gave up on that as I was as I was focused. Um, we actually don't have a BSW program. Um, about so, and I'm I'm trying to think. We have a, a only a small number of our students. I would I think in our graduating class this year, it is a we have about 10 percent of our our graduating students are advanced standing. Um, but we don't have a BSW program here. And then in terms of implementation science, in, I am really, really excited that this year um, Enola Proctor has um, piloted a course around implementation practice, which has gotten very, very favorable feedback. So, so Enola's um, scholarship is around implementation science, and we've had many conversations that social workers are really on the, the front end of, of bringing evidence-based practices and bringing the evidence-based um, evidence treatments and then bringing the evidence-based practice model into organizational settings. And, and so her course has and is, in fact, Thing, um, specifically on how do we how do we do that? How do we then take into account? Um, how do we think about organizational capacity, organizational the, the setting, the policies, how that all impacts um, implementation? How do we best? How do we make decisions on which implementation strategy we should in fact be using? What fits best within the the organization? So I'm I'm really excited that we have that in, and we'll continue that in future um, semesters as well. 
Wonderful. Thank you for sharing just those, um, those two points. I thought that that would be worthy to spend an extra minute or two on. Um, this is Suzanne Kearns, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about an interdisciplinary workforce initiative that we have going on at the University of Washington. And um, I wanted to share this example with folks. It does not, um, it does not live in the School of Social Work, although social work is involved in our curriculum and our, um, their students take the courses. But this, uh, this particular initiative was conceptualized uh, to be interdisciplinary from the outset. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. Um, and let me just advance the slide. There we go. So we started out with our initiative um, thinking about who are the main folks who graduate students that go on in, to provide mental health services. And created a multidisciplinary university task force that consisted of um, representatives from educational or school psychology, nursing, uh, the psychiatry and behavioral sciences, psychology, social work, special education. And we also include a rotating position that's a student representative on the group as well, just to make sure that we're kind of hitting the mark for what the students need as well. And it was really important from the outset for us to have this multi um, or interprofessional group c coming together um, so that we could really think creatively about what type of a curriculum might be beneficial and also giving students an opportunity to have classes in an interprofessional environment, which um, they tell us, you know, obviously from a, I teach one of the classes, from an instructor standpoint, it can be both a strength and a challenge, um, but the students tell us that the, the challenges, the strengths far outweigh the challenges that they experience um, by being in those groups. So um, our, our group conceptualized two pathways uh, for our initiative. One was thinking about who goes on to be the future providers or actually the, the folks who um, specifically deliver the interventions. And the second pathway are who are the folks that we would really want to engage in knowledge about best practices and what's out there, kind of folks who might be in refer pathways, advocates for children, um, that kind of a thing. And I should also mention ours is focused on children and youth at the current time, although we're looking at an adult, um, a similar one for adults. So for the folks that we're going to, the students who are going on to be future providers, we conceptualized a course series. And inside our course series, uh, at the University of Washington, we're on a quarter system. So when we first started this initiative, we had four courses. Uh, we had to drop one of the courses because they moved over into a whole different unit and matriculated students weren't able to take the class anymore. So I'm not going to talk about that one as much. But we surveyed students and also community members and heard that overwhelmingly people felt like they needed to learn about anxiety and trauma, um, behavioral parenting interventions, and how to manage extreme and complex problems in children and youth. So we built our course series around those three areas. Um, each of those three quarter long courses, um, the students both learn the foundational and underlying skills associated with delivery of um, those types of evidence-based interventions in general, how to read the literature about it, different aspects of um, how to make it culturally competent, those types of things. But then they also learn a specific evidence-based practice, similar, similar to what Trish was talking about, that they have their seven. We, we have three in our initiative. They actually learn um, head to tail. So for example, in the class that I teach, which is the Behavioral Parenting Interventions course, those students learn um, a, a model that was developed by Bob McMahon and Rex Forehand called Helping the Noncompliant Child. And they get the official training that they would get if they went to a seminar to learn it. Lots of practice opportunities, very active. We're currently working on also finding strategies for linking students that take those courses up with practicum opportunities. And as was sort of mentioned by Joanne, we kind of are hit and miss with that right now. It's really hard when you're even just working with one department, but when you're looking at kind of bridging all of the different requirements of all the different departments and all the different field sites and that kind of thing, it's, 
just a real challenge. And so we've been um, kind of slowly chipping away <laughs> at that part of our initiative. The, the, the referrer pathway, what we decided to do was to institute a speaker series that would hopefully bring, have an opportunity for, um, for lack of a better word, bi-directional dialogue between the community and um, folks at the university about best practices and highlight different types of um, types of uh, treatments that are available and um, different systems in which kids interact, that kind of thing. So we have evaluated our, uh, our workforce. And we can talk in more detail about this either in a future webinar or also we just got this written up and published in the Journal of Emotional and Behavioral Disorders. So if anyone is interested in reading about it in more detail, I can forward you the link for that. Um, it's online ahead of print right now. Um, Uh-oh. Something weird just happened as I tried to advance my slide. Can someone advance the slide for me, please? Oh, there we go. OK. Oops. <laughs> there we go. So just to give you a quick highlight, we evaluate all of the students pre and post um, the, the training. And we really look at their skills and their self-reported self-efficacy in addition to all the students having to pass kind of a core competency criteria to pass the class. And so I just wanted to show you some of the results um, of kind of student self-reported skills when they come into the training or come into the course, which is um, here, you know, they're kind of low on the scale. And we see over a two standard deviation increase is a very significant increase at the post-training. So um, I just kind of wanted to highlight that finding. And we, we looked specifically at what students were increasing most in, because we were worried maybe it was just a general sense of self-efficacy. Um, but what we found is that the thing that was really driving this change more than anything else was really some of the very specific skills that are associated with implementing evidence-based practices. So we were really excited about that. And then I just to kind of also show you our, um, our speaker series that we have, um, we were really happy about this too over time that we usually get somewhere between 20 and 80 attendees for each lecture, average is about 30. But what we've really been able to do over time is grow this, um, this uh, part of the pie chart over here, the community agencies piece, that we really have been successful in starting to bridge that gap between the university and the community in talking about the various evidence-based practices. So in the interest of time, I'm actually going to stop here because you'll have a chance to, if folks want to hear more, you can read about it. We can also send out the link for the article and turn it over to my colleagues, Elizabeth and Dina. Good Thanks afternoon. Us. So I'm, uh, we've been talking about, and we will continue to talk about some initiatives. Uh, this is Elizabeth Kanata, by the way. Talk about some initiatives that um, promote the teaching of evidence-based practice as a process and of specific evidence-based treatments that emanate from within the university themselves. What I'm going to talk to you about now, and, and in collaboration with Dr. Dana Marlowe, is an initiative that was actually a course that was developed by, by providers um, but to be taught by university faculty to um, meet a, a significant workforce need that we had in Connecticut with the idea of being able to overcome one of the barriers to teaching about specific evidence-based treatment models is that it's hard for faculty to teach models that they haven't been directly trained in. So the need that developed in Connecticut was that um, about 15 years ago, we made a significant investment in the state in, in the implementation of specific evidence-based treatment models to keep kids in the community, models like multisystemic therapy, multidimensional family therapy, functional family therapy, models that are designed to keep kids uh, in the community, in their homes, rather than inpatient hospitalization, residential placement. And the state um, really broadly disseminated through public funding these models so that um, we have over 450 master's level clinician positions available at, or, or in operation at any one point in time, over 25 agencies that deliver one or more of these models. And despite the fact that we have many graduate training programs that feed our small state in terms of workforce, um, the reality was that providers were continuously lamenting that we couldn't hire people into these positions who had any clue about what they were getting into. 
and sometimes they had been taught that evidence-based practice can be limiting and to beware. So the opportunity arose um, to develop a curriculum through some funding that the state obtained, federal funding um, through the Mental Health Transformation State Incentive Grant Program. And this was an opportunity, the, the grants developed the infrastructure for behavioral health service delivery. And so we had some funding to develop a curriculum that could be then taught to faculty of graduate training programs feeding the Connecticut workforce in the specific models that um, that are of such concern to us. And so we also had the opportunity to develop curriculum that would, would provide the depth of knowledge to the faculty to be able to teach the course with the support also of model developers of these specific models to sort of vet the content of the course to make sure that what was being taught was accurate. So the, um, the curriculum design provides an overview of the specific, there are nine models that are included in the course, and the idea is not to train graduate students in any one specific model in terms of a level of certification, but really to provide an exposure to the models and, and, and to some of the core comp competencies of these in-home family treatment models, um, and to provide an opportunity to practice some of the skills that are used, the tools that are used within the curriculum. We also bring in guest presenters of the specific uh, models that talk about what it's like doing the work, and we bring in families to talk about their experience receiving the, the services. The, um, the, the curriculum, the course, is fully developed in terms of all of the content I'll talk to you about in a moment, but then there's a faculty fellowship so that the faculty can feel comfortable utilizing the tools and have depth to their understanding of the models that then allows them to teach the course. Um, in the beginning, we also had funding that would support launching the course in any graduate school where it might be difficult to add an elective temporarily onto the books, but that really wasn't needed in most places. So when I talk about a toolkit, I'm really talking about professors, the fellows that take the, the course to learn about the, the curriculum have everything they need, exam questions, PowerPoint slides, they have um, discussion guides, they have ideas about activities they can do and specific instructions for utilizing those in the classroom, all of the reading materials, sample syllabi. And um, at the end of the course, they also have a certificate that the professor will give to those students completing this full semester three credit course. Um, that they can give to students, that students can then include on their resume as a way to alerting providers that they have this core background. And the success has been really quite extensive. We've trained over 14 graduate training programs have invested in this, more than 27 actually now faculty have been trained in the model across different d disciplines um, of behavioral health. You can see the five MSW programs listed there. Um, I will also point out that many of the graduate schools decided that this was content that was helpful for their students regardless of practice setting they might go into, and so it's a required course um, in four programs. All of their students get this course, and then in many it's a regularly offered elective. The feedback has been tremendously positive from students, faculty, and from the trainers of the specific models who now feel that the people coming into the workforce are better prepared to do this kind of work. So I'm going to pass it over to Dana to talk about the experience of using this course within Fordham's MSW program. Hi, it's Dana Marlowe. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, so at Fordham, we've had an incredibly smooth transition of the implementation of this class. Um, and a major reason, one major reason, was really due to the foundation that we already had in place. Um, so we already had two required research classes taught in the MSW program. We had an evidence-based practice class being taught in our doctoral program. And we had continuous support from our dean and associate dean. Um, and Fordham was also one of the 10 programs in the Schools of Social Work Dean's Consortium Project for Evidence-Based Practice and Mental Health. And I add this because I think this is really significant in showing that our school really prioritized evidence-based practice. So in addition to the school already supporting us, uh, we had two faculty who were trained by the Wheeler Clinic. And just that training alone and having that infrastructure in place was extremely important uh, to develop this course. And you know, again, so we had the school on board, and then we had the Wheeler Clinic supporting us. Um, it was really also very important having our curriculum committee supporting us, uh, just approving our syllabus, <laughs> uh, the course curriculum, again, extremely important. And then the reality of working in academia the clinical committee had to support us, and our assistant dean had to make sure our class was always on the schedule. And again, that's just the reality. Having our elective 
there as an option for students. And the two faculty members, one of them being myself, you know, we were very committed to being trained in these models through the faculty fellowship. I can't imagine having faculty not interested or committed to this. I don't think it would be successful if they then went through the training. Um, in terms of our successes, or a little bit about the history, so two of our faculty members took the fellowship in 2009. Since 2010, uh, the course has been delivered seven times, and we've taught 140 students. We are offering the course again this summer, and uh, again as an online class in our online program this fall, um, which I think is extremely exciting. I believe it's the first one of its kind in, this, in terms of this content. And, um, as I said, we're developing it right now, and it'll uh, go live, as you will, um, in August. Okay. So just some important considerations in terms of offering a course like this. Very important to have overall support, or as much support from your faculty as possible. We have a very large faculty, but um, at least the majority of them was, were very supportive. Uh, also, obviously, the syllabus and developing that we had a lot of help from the Wheeler Clinic on that. And again, your curriculum committee, if you are going to be offering a course like this. You know, you can think that you've developed this wonderful syllabus and curriculum, but if the school is not on board, it just is not going to fly. Uh, and then maintaining the course as part of the curriculum. This, again, was very important. Uh, from working in academia, we always have a limited number of electives that are offered. There is some competition there. Uh, and, you know, we wanted to make sure that the school was always prioritizing this course, and that is really what has happened for us. Very lucky. This isn't to say we haven't had some challenges, um, as I have on the slide, where the course comes out of the state of Connecticut. However, we have students from Connecticut, New York, New York and New Jersey, so it was really very important to us to make the course appealing to the students from all the different states. And then, again, promoting student interest. Um, if I called this course evidence-based practice and in-home treatment models, a lot of my students probably would not take it. Instead, we really focus on the fact that they're working with children and adolescents and families, and then these clinical students are extremely uh, interested in taking it. And then just to kind of sum up, uh, there were a lot of opportunities in offering a course like this. First of all, it's incredibly relevant, um, and we believe that students need to be learning about evidence-based practice models. Uh, we have four or five speakers that come in, uh, four providers, and usually some a family member who's been through one of the models. This is invaluable for our students. It's probably their favorite part of the course. Uh, for the professors, they're incredible resources. Uh, we encourage networking for the students. We always have a few students who end up working in these models by the time they're graduating. Um, and the truth is, it's wonderful to have a professor who's truly trained to teach specific models. I think this is the rarity. Uh, but just to emphasize, again, it could be a great course, but you have to plan with the key players of your school and really find where the course will fit into your curriculum. And again, expect challenges, because if you expect them, then you really will be prepared in offering them. OK, I think I'm done with my part. You did very well. Thank you, Dana. Um, so I'm Rosalind Bertram. I'm at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. And I'm going to offer a couple of examples of how we're integrating uh, National Implementation Research Network frameworks uh, into our curriculum and how that's beginning to feed more interest through the students um, prompting the faculty to be teaching more evidence-based practice. Um, we think that the frameworks themselves can be a bridge between field curricula and academic curricula and are very much attempting to do that with our National Child Welfare Workforce Initiative University Partnership Grant, which I'll also speak about. So very quickly, this may be uh, something that everyone knows, but this is what our students learn. We've redesigned our program evaluation course so that it's really an implementation and evaluation course. And they learn to think through NIRN frameworks. Their very first paper is based upon their field site. Um, 
They have a multi, and, and you'll see a slide on this that will present more detail, but their very first paper, they take a look at to what extent is the model well-defined at their field site using these intervention component uh, elements. Their second paper in that course, based on the findings from paper one, um, examines to what extent competency drivers and organization drivers have actually been adjusted at their field site to support whatever the practice model is. Um, this has been published recently in Journal of Evidence-Based Social Work. Um, those are three of the students out of that course. Um, and in that article, we take a look at their findings, which frankly for Kansas City, uh, it's not a pretty picture. Um, they do multi-method evaluations in which they first examine written materials um, at the site describing the program itself, the population served. They do purposeful sample, stratified sample, uh, semi-structured interviews with staff, examining to what extent the staff understand and can articulate both population of interest characteristics as well as the practice model. Um, and then they compare those uh, sets of data with what the peer-reviewed literature says for that population or for that type of practice model. They repeat that in paper two, looking at the competency drivers and the organization drivers. So to what extent has staff selection, training, coaching been adjusted, data systems uh, been adjusted to evaluate for fidelity, to inform staff development, to what extent have policies and procedures been adjusted to support the practice model, et cetera. Um, based on the findings, they make recommendations to improve these programs. Um, and of course, this is presented to their field site. It's presented to our, our field office. And what we're seeing over the course of about four years that we've been teaching this um, is the students are now spontaneously questioning the content of their other courses. Um, why are we being taught what we're being taught in our practice courses? Why aren't we being taught specific practice models? Why don't we have a better understanding of the theory base for elements and activities of a practice model? Shouldn't our HIPSI course be something different? Which is really a very nice way of beginning to see change in the academic curricula. Um, these are some of the lessons that come out of that process from this course, and every student has to take this course. It's a required course in the concentration year. Um, and I think I'm going to skip ahead into the NICWI because I can elaborate on this a little bit more. I want to attend to our time here. Um, we've taken these lessons over the last four years and built elements of use of implementation science and frameworks and some of these activities out of this course into our NICWI grant. We're one of uh, 11 original uh, grantees in the latest uh, five-year round of funding uh, trying to transform academic curricula at the same time that we're transforming child, child welfare itself in Missouri. Um, here's how we actually build some of this into the grant itself. Um, without going into great deal, detail on who we're, we're, we're looking for someone besides traditional child welfare experienced students. We want um, more like Teach for America model of, of, of uh, granting these traineeships, which is full tuition and intensive cohort experience. Um, and we give them postgraduate employment um, in, in the child welfare field. Um, but this is one of the key changes that I want to highlight. We changed field experience. They do field rotations, much like medical school. They rotate through both public and private child welfare service models. Um, they have field learning plans that actively focus through implementation science and frameworks. Uh, we divide up their eight-week field rotations on a three-week, two-week, three-week basis, in which the first three weeks, they're doing essentially what those students do in that program implementation evaluation course, looking at the printed material, uh, what's the practice model, who's the population, observing staff, whether or not they're actually doing that, um, and then, and this is key, going to the literature, selecting appropriate literature on the population or the practice model, and feeding it into the field instruction for discussion. 
So we're actually seeding thinking in child welfare about evidence-based practice by doing this. Um, they report back on this process through a weekly field portfolio where we can track what is actually being shared with instructors. Uh, we can track the act actual learning of the, the uh, trainees. Um, and implicitly, this weekly field portfolio, which is sent to the field instructor, and myself as the principal investigator, um, and to their uh, field seminar coordinator, um, we're actually implicitly seeding uh, data-informed staff development in child welfare. Because every week, based on what the students say they're learning or what their questions are, um, the instructor has to adjust the development of that trainee for the next week in the next week's learning activities. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to move ahead a bit. This is reinforced in my work with the field instructors every five weeks, where we actually review their use of the field portfolios. We review the introduction and use of the peer-reviewed literature uh, from the trainees to the instructors. Um, we have built-in uh, feedback loops of evaluation with the instructors uh, and with the trainees at the end of uh, each semester. Um, this guides adjustments to the implementation of the grant semester by semester and year by year. Um, it's really a rather unique process. That field, I'm sorry, that uh, uh, program implementation and evaluation course is in the second year of the traineeship. And for that time period, uh, that, that fall semester, the trainees stay in place so that they can conduct a full implementation evaluation. And those findings and recommendations go not only to their field instructor at that site, at a single site, but they also go to our state director of the children's division. And he consciously brings this into his considerations as other uh, systems change efforts are underway. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to jump through a couple of these. I think it's obvious to some extent what the lessons are, that are being learned here about evidence-based practice and about implementation science through this grant. Um, there are larger change initiatives where we're getting to amplify on these, these, these movements that, that are, are being engendered through this process. We're redesigning the family-centered service model for Missouri, anchoring in specific evidence-based practice elements. Um, Kansas City itself is going to be a transformation zone for this where we work through the implementation competency drivers, organization drivers, to get the new model implemented appropriately before we scale up across the state. Again, I want to be conscious of time and give us a chance to talk a bit and to poll. So I'm going to move forward. Um, the full slide presentation as well as uh, the audio from this will be available within the next two or three days on the consortium's website. Um, and I think I'd like to move us into some discussion. I have not been able to track comments while I've been presenting. So, Sue or David, if there are some things that should be woven into discussion here, this is the time period for that. Um, Anybody? I think that's, yeah, I just think that there's been a really uh, nice discussion in the chat, uh, the chat forum, although we certainly haven't heard from everybody who's on the uh, on the webinar, so I would encourage anybody who has thoughts to um, to put that, you know, post them and consider them. But um, you know, as far as things to stand out, you know, I think that there's been a lot of movement and talk about how to make the practicums really meaningful, and we had a little bit of action around kind of thinking about the politics and how you, you know, the the point that you brought up about sometimes accidentally having people, and Dana brought this up too, you know teaching students things and make them question classes that they're getting from other faculty in your own department, <laughs> you know, those types of things. So that, 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 that is, yeah, that is so key because you can't tackle issues of faculty governance head on. You have to uh, work around the edges and tickle from underneath, in my experience. Um, people are not sure what they know, what they don't know. It's not comfortable to say what they don't know. Um, and this just begins a process, at least that's what we're finding here. Um, 
the uh, the discussion is going to be transferred out of the public chat that we're we're now contributing to onto our website where we can continue this discussion. But for the purposes of um, time, since we only have about five minutes left, and we do want to give you the opportunity to shape webinar three, we've thrown a lot of information into one hour, and there are many, many things that could be discussed in greater detail. So Colin, if you would put up the poll, we would like to ask participants from today's example, um, what would you like more details on? Um, you've heard how George Warren Brown School of Social Work has uh, attempted to integrate both the process as well as specific treatment models of evidence-based practice. Uh, throughout their curriculum, we've heard the example from the University of Washington of multiple disciplines working to develop uh, better behavioral evidence-based behavioral health care. Um, we've heard the Connecticut and Fordham models, which began with a behavioral clinic developing a course and then teaching faculty how to actually do <laughs> teach that course as well as teaching students. And we have heard uh, my presentation of some of the changes that have been made in our curricula at UMKC and in specific in uh, the National Child Welfare Workforce Initiative grant. So if you could indicate, and we'll take a few minutes more, uh, which you'd like to hear more about, we will organize webinar three um, based on what your feedback is. Um, so I'm looking and I'm seeing so far about nine respondents. That's almost everybody. Um, okay. Should we, uh, looks like George Warren Brown School of Social Work in the UMKC. Um, Missouri is getting a lot of attention. Um, I think I think there, there were also uh, public comments, though, asking for more information about the Connecticut Fordham, uh, Fordham example, uh, syllabi, et cetera. So that's what I think is going to wind up going into webinar three. We'll have a discussion about this after today's webinar is complete. Um, but it looks like we will concentrate. And I just lost my PowerPoint. There it is. OK. Thank you, Colin, for that poll. The last thing we would like you to do uh, before you leave completely is take a moment to evaluate the webinar itself. Uh, we have a link here to SurveyMonkey. You can copy and paste in, or I think you might be able to actually click on it. Let me see if that works. Yes, it does. You can actually click on that link, and it will take you to uh, a survey uh, that will help us evaluate how we organize and present these webinars. Um, jo Joanna Schaefer is saying she'd like more details on all the models presented. Could the syllabi be shared somewhere? Yes, we could actually put that up on our website, ebpconsortium.com. Um, but I think we can also dig deeper in, in putting together our third webinar. Um, and Rosalind, um, you want to just talk about what the, um, like, the, the presumptive date when we might actually do the webinar? Yeah. Well, I, I would actually like a quick feedback if you could type in. Theoretically, this could be done um, within another month or so, or we could wait until fall semester. I'm thinking probably based on the interest that was shown you might like to have it sooner rather than later. Um, so if anybody could type in whether or not a June webinar would be something that they would participate in, uh, that would be helpful. Multiple attendees are typing. <laughs> so um, I think the main thing is we want to be sure that we've got sufficient interest for something to be presented at the end of spring semester, at the beginning of June or mid-June. Time period. Right, and that's my concern, as you know, um, is what happens on campuses over uh, the, at the end of the semesters or quarters and, and the summer months. But uh, we'll see what people say. Um, yeah. I, I just want to say, because I know we're, we've got to close, first of all, I want to thank the University of Maryland School of Social Work um, because uh, they provided the platform and 
Colin for his uh, wonderful assistance throughout. And I also uh, want to encourage people to go to the EBP Consortium website to access a lot of the materials that uh, Rosalind has, has mentioned and um, that we're very excited about. We encourage you to become a part of our network um, and that way not be left out of anything that is produced and, and offered. And I think that uh, there's been so much rich discussion today and as one of the uh, uh, presenters indicated in their chat, uh, they really, it's amazing how well all of this fits together from different parts of the country and different approaches. And it's really marvelous to, to know about this. And it's really important to get this word out. So those of you who did attend today, if you could really um, uh, become uh, preachers of the gospel, so to speak, uh, and get this out to folks and let them know how they can access uh, the audio track as well as the slides from the website. Uh, that would be great because we really need to get the word out. The how-to aspect of this is just wonderful. So thank you um, all of the presenters for what you, uh, what you provided today. And um, we look forward to connecting with all of you again. Thank you and have a great afternoon.